Um, today is November 30th, 2016. We're at the office of Robin MacArthur on MacArthur Road. Um, my name is Maria Rosner. Today's production crew is Ben Kowalski on video camera, um, Rosalie Smith on audio recorder, and on still camera we have Josh Mercier. Okay. Um, Robin, would you talk a little bit? Uh, yeah, how is this volume, Rosalie? Alright. I will be back for third. Okay. You probably still be talking to them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your personal background. Mm -hmm. Um, have you always lived in Marlboro? Um, I was born in Marlboro. I was born on this hillside. My parents live through the woods a little ways, and I was born on the living room couch in that house. And then I grew up here. I went to Marlboro Elementary School. I went to BUHS. And then I went away for college. And when I was in my 20s, I lived for a while in New York City, actually working for documentary filmmakers. So I did spend a lot of time with cameras and sound equipment like you guys are doing. And um, I then started recording music with Ty, who's now my husband. And we lived in New York for a couple of years and then lived in Philadelphia for probably three or four years and then moved back here. And um, yeah, when I was 16, I built that little cabin that's through the woods over there, which you could get a still shot of later. I built that when I was 16 with my dad, and it was right here, where the, in this room, where this is. And then Ty and I came back when we were in our mid-20s and built a little one-room insulated cabin attached to that. And so when, I, when we were living in New York and Philadelphia, we would come back and have this cabin to stay in. And then eventually... We moved back and moved that old funky cabin out of the way, built this kitchen office where it was, and I've kept adding on to this house ever since then. So, most of my life, but not all of my life here in um, Marlboro. So this isn't the house, this isn't the exact house you grew up in, but... Yeah, no, I did not grow up in this house. Um, Ty and I built this one ourselves mostly ourselves and over the course of 10 years I think we or probably 15 years since when we first started that little insulated cabin to our new addition so every time we have a kid we build another addition on our house but now we're done with kids and additions <laughs> the house is big enough um, but the house that I grew up in is across the hill um, a house that my parents built, and then my dad grew up in a farmhouse up the hill, just up there. So from our house, I'm, our house, my house is pretty much situated right in the middle between my grandparents' house and my parents' house, so I can see both of them from this house this time of year, which is pretty cool. And um, where specifically in town do you live? I live, this is MacArthur Road. So when my grandparents moved here in the 1940s, this road was just a little dirt track. There were no other houses on it other than their farmhouse. And their, that house that they moved into is an old farmhouse built in 1803, and it had been abandoned. So the, there were porcupines living in the basement who had chewed through the floor, and a lot of the windows were broken. And there was no running water and no electricity, so they moved there. They had two babies at the time, and they kept out, they had three more kids, and they, they were the only family on this road, so the town named this road, MacArthur Road. And since then, uh, there's a lot of family members have built houses here on the road, and obviously other people too, so it's a real road with power lines and septic systems and all of that. <laughs> Um, and what is your physical home address? Physical home address is 920 MacArthur Road. Okay. Um, when did you build the house you live in now? So, uh, like I said earlier, it's it's been a long time in construction. I built that original cabin when I was 16. This was all woods. None of these trees were cleared. and. 
my dad and I just came out with a chainsaw and some scraps of old salvaged wood. And we built this cabin. We cut down, it was just piled, the foundation was some piles of rocks and a couple of tree stumps. And I would go there and write poetry and just live, have my own little private life in this cabin in the woods. And then the first edition happened when I was probably 25, second edition when I was 28, third edition when I was 32. <laughs> Um, how would you describe yourself as a child? Huh. I was pretty quiet. Um, I was an observer. I liked to listen to what was going on around me as opposed to making lots of noise. Um, uh, yeah. I liked to write a lot, so I had this little, even at my parents' house, we had a little playhouse in the woods that was, used to be a cow shed, and then we turned it into a little playhouse for my brother and I with a couple bunk beds and a little table. And I would go out there and make tea, pretend tea out of sticks and leaves and water, and write poetry. So it's kind of what I still do. Still doing that. Um, may I ask how old you are now? I am 38, I believe. <laughs> Pretty sure, though I might be 37, you have to ask my daughter. <laughs> um, do you have any other siblings aside from your brother? Uh, just my brother, Jason, who lives up the road. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are your parents' names and what have been their careers? Uh, so my parents are Dan and Gail MacArthur. And my dad grew up here on the road, and he has had a career since he was about 18 building timber frame houses and barns and doing carpentry of all kinds. And my mom moved here when she was 18, moved here to be with my dad, and she, had, she drove the school bus since I was a baby, so for pretty much 38 years I think she drove the school bus in town and probably drove all of you on the school bus. And she also has a farm where she grows organic vegetables and black blueberries and blackberries and raspberries. So farmers, carpenters, school bus drivers. That's how my parents have made a living. Um, what's your partner's name? My husband's name is Tyler Gibbons. Uh, where is he from? He is from Brattleboro. We went. We both went to BUHS High School together, and met there. Yeah. Um, what career has he been involved with? So he's a musician, and uh, he has always been in bands. And we had a band together for ten years called Red Heart the Ticker. We kind of still have a, this band together, but kind of not since I've stopped performing. Um, but, uh, so he is a songwriter, and we have recorded, as Red Heart the Ticker, we've recorded three albums of our own music, and uh, one album of traditional Vermont folk songs that my grandmother, Margaret MacArthur, who lived in the farmhouse up the road, collected around Vermont. So in the, when she was living here in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, she wanted to collect, see what kind of the old Vermont folk music traditions of this area were. So she went around, when her kids were young, she stuffed and brought them around to these back roads and found people who knew old folk songs and recorded them on a little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And so she ended up recording a lot of songs and then performing those songs herself and making lots of albums of music, of Vermont folk songs. And Tyler and I made an album called Your Name in Secret I Would Write, which is a handful of those songs, I think ten of those songs, that we made our own versions of. And, uh, yeah. Uh, what are your children's names? Their names are Ava Margaret Gibbons and Owen Cricket Wood Gibbons. Those are their full names. And how old are they? Ava is eight and Owen is four. Um, your daughter is currently a... At, um, was, at, is currently a student at the Marlboro School. Um, who have been her teachers there and what grade is she presently in? 
She is presently in third grade with Erica, so she's had Erica, and last year she had Judy, and the year before, or two years before that, she had Ellen. And um, your son attends the Meeting House School. Mm -hmm. um, who are his teachers there? His teachers this year are Miss Honeysuckle, Patty Donnelly, and uh, Gemma, whose name I can't remember at the moment. Miss Gemma. <laughs> Okay, um, you attended the Melrose School when you were a child. Um, who were your teachers then? My teachers were Esther Fielding I had for kindergarten. For first and second grade I had John Morris. Then I had Mrs. Nero. Then I had Johnny or Mr. Esau. We called him both things. And then I had David. I was David's first class. At, at MES, and then I had um, uh, Michael Edelstein for junior high. Yeah. So everybody has now retired. <laughs> None of those teachers are still there. It's a whole new crew. Yeah. Um, what are some similarities you recognize from your experiences then and the way the school is today? Hmm. Um, it's wonderful how much, how many field trips the kids are still taking. Like today, Ava went to the museum, and they go apple picking and do work at Hogback, and there was a lot of that when I was a kid there. We would go. One of my, some of my favorite things were when I was there. Bruce Cole was the principal, so there would be days where he would say, "It's a beautiful day. Everybody climb in the bus. We're gonna go hike Hogback." And the school can't really do that anymore, but I like that um, they try as hard as they can, you know, the trips to Costa Rica. And, um, do you still do, we did the Cape Cod trip and New York trip when I was there, Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, and just, just really encouraging students to think for themselves and do creative projects like this. When I was in junior high, I did a documentary film project about an artist with a couple other friends of mine. And we would go to her house with our video cameras and interview her and made a whole like 15 minute documentary about her that she then went around and used as part of her how, when she had shows places, she would use this documentary that we made, and we were 13 when we did it, or 12 maybe, so that was very cool to feel like we were professional filmmakers in 12 years old. But I really love that about Marlboro, that um, you're, all, you're in, in, encouraged to be creative and to think for yourselves and to do projects that interest you. I'm a big believer that people learn when they're excited by the things that they're learning. So, yeah, um, and what are some of the differences you've noticed? Um, you all get to study violin. I never got to study violin. What else? Um, I think there's, there's less flexibility in terms of being able to hop in the bus and go on a spontaneous field trip. And I think there's... I, you know, I think it's unfortunate that there's more testing. Um, schools are just under a lot more pressure to teach kids to learn to read and write by certain ages and also um, to teach computer skills by certain ages, which just puts a lot of pressure on those early grades. And so I think there's less time for creative work, especially in those early grades, than there was when I was a kid. Did you have standardized tests or anything like that? We, we had a couple, and I can't remember what grades they were in, and I remember that they just weren't a big deal, and we hardly even knew that they were happening. But it's not as many as you guys have to do now, so I'm sorry about that. I can't stand testing. I think testing is ridiculous, and that it's just not a good way to gauge how students are learning. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about your working life as a writer and musician. Um, let's, begin, let's begin with your career as an author. Um, when did you realize you wanted to work as a writer? I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a writer. And like I said, I would spend time in that cabin in the woods writing poetry, and I wanted to be a writer. I mean, 
I was such a quiet person that writing always felt like an, the right intuitive place for me. That's how I wanted to express myself in the world. But then I got, for some reason I got, I went to BUHS and I didn't have any writing teachers or writing classes there. And then I went to college and I was almost too intimidated to be a writer. I thought that it was a profession that I was just not smart enough or talented enough to do. So I, it took me a while, so I got into documentary filmmaking, I got into making music, and it, it took me a while in my, until I was back in my mid-twenties that I really admitted to myself that what I wanted to do was right, and that I was going to believe in myself and make it happen. So, something I always wanted to do, but sometimes it takes a while for us to take those leaps of faith. So, when you were in college, um, did you take writing courses? I took some writing courses. I was all I took poetry classes and some fiction writing classes, but like I said, I was I was just kind of too intimidated. I went to kind of an elite college where there were a lot of kids who had come from really fancy prep schools and private schools, and had had all of this writing background throughout their high school years, and I saw the work that they were making and just thought that I had missed that opportunity and that I would never be a good enough writer to compete with them and what they were doing. So, yes, I, took, I was taking classes, but I also thought that I wasn't worthy of the career. But that's foolish. When you get to college, I hope that you do whatever you want to do and have faith in yourselves and don't worry what anyone else is making. <laughs> And um, what college did you attend for your undergraduate work? I went to Brown University, which is in Providence. And, um, yeah, it's a wonderful place, but it's also uh, a very elite college. So there were, a lot of, there were a lot of students who, a lot of privilege there. Yeah. And um, what graduate school did you attend? I went to Vermont College of Fine Arts, which is a low residency graduate school for the arts in Vermont, in Montpelier. So it's two, nor two hours north of here, and you, um, the way that a low residency program works is you go and it's a two-year program and you spend ten days there every six months, one, once in the winter and once in the summer, and you work closely with faculty and your peers when you're there. And then during the rest of the year, you write and you send packets to your professors, and your professors read your work and send comments back. So I, I think it's a great way to do a program if you're a writer, since writing is about writing, not socializing. Yeah, and what was your master's thesis study about? It was... Um, it was a collection of short stories, which is my book that I got published. So almost all of the stories in Half Wild, which is my book, were written during my time in graduate school. And that is a collection of stories about Vermont, um, short stories, fiction, set in a fictional town that is a little bit like Marlboro and a little bit like Reedsboro and a little bit like Halifax and a little bit like... Um, some of the smaller, more wooded towns surrounding Brattleboro. And um, who encouraged your early efforts to become a published author? Hmm. My grandmother, who is this folk singer, would always say, I don't, she just decided that I was going to be the writer in the family. So she would always say, Robin, write that down. You have to write a story about that. <laughs> Even though I wasn't, I wasn't telling anyone that I wanted to be a writer. She would just always say that to me. So that was always in the back of my head, that my grandmother believed in me. And um, I had great teachers when I was at Marlboro Elementary School, and a good teacher, one good teacher when I was in college. And then it was really when I got to graduate school that I had faculty that said, you can do this. It's scary. It's like, it's really hard to be an artist. It's a very vulnerable profession to have enough faith in yourself to put your work out there and believe that it's a worthwhile way to spend your time and worthwhile other, worth other people's time to listen to it. Um, and you recently published your first collection of short stories. Um, what's the title of the book? The book is called Half Wild Stories. And yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the stories are about? 
So the stories are all set in a fictional town in southern Vermont. Um, like I said, it's it's the town and the story in the book is called Vicksburg, but it's it's somewhat based on Marlboro, somewhat based on Reedsboro, Halifax, Wardsboro. Um, even I have friends who live in the Northeast Kingdom who have said that it reminds them a lot of that part of Vermont, so really the wooded areas of Vermont. And the stories are about a lot of things. There's a I read somewhere that somebody say that all all good writing comes from heartbreak. And for me, these stories originate in my own wrestling with home and my feelings about home. Is this the place that I belong or is or is this not the place that I belong? When I lived in cities in New York and Philadelphia and traveled, I would just pine for home. I missed this place. And yet when I was here and I was in my 20s, I felt like it was stifling and um, when I couldn't really be who I wanted to be when I was here. So there's a lot of that in the stories, that push and pull towards and away from home. There's also a lot about wildness and what we, what we gain from living near the woods and near streams and these encounters with wildlife that we can have when we're here and this just deep connection to seasons and and nature and what that does kind of for our spirits and how that fosters the wildness within us. So those are some of the themes. And um, what other literary projects have you worked on? Well, I'm currently trying to finish a second draft of a novel, which is due to my editor in two weeks. So I have 90,000 words on my computer right there that I am trying to... Here it is! Here's. Here's the most recent printed version that I'm, it's full of all of these edits. And this will be a novel that will be published next year. I just have to, I just have to finish it and make it good <laughs> in two weeks or maybe in two months. Yeah. Um, where or with whom did you study writing so that you could gain the skills and ability to author entire books? Um, I would say that my graduate, I really, it would have taken me a long time if I hadn't gone to graduate school. I just, I, I think, and, and it's not that you have to go to graduate school, but I really think you need some teachers who believe in what you're doing and who are encouraging you to keep going and to, and to keep working on it because writing is... You know, it's, it's fun to write a first draft, but so much of what makes a book good is revision and editing. And I mean, my stories have just hundreds of revisions and edits in them. And this novel will probably have hundreds of edits and revisions. So in order to power through those revisions, you really need to have somebody telling you that what you're making is worthwhile and worth spending all that time on. So I just had some fabulous teachers in my graduate program who were those people for me. But I've also worked as a freelance editor for other um, writers, and I love that role. And there are a lot of editors who do that who are not part of, part of graduate programs. So you can find those teachers who will read your work and encourage you to keep going without being part of a graduate program. Um, and what have been some of your highlights of your writing career thus far, such as personal accomplishments or awards or critical acclaim? It's pretty fabulous to just hold... I wonder if I have a copy of my book right here. Um, here. Yeah, I can do this, right? This will all be edited. Yeah. I think holding my book in my hand for the first time was just pretty thrilling. I worked on these stories for so long. And the critical acclaim is, is somewhat exciting. I had some reviews that were positive, and it was, um, it was picked up by independent booksellers as like one of their exciting books for the year, and Barnes & Noble selected it as one of their picks for the summer. But really the most gratifying thing is when I get personal notes. So I have 
some letters that dear friends wrote to me that were just really touching about how the book made them feel about their own lives, and then also notes from strangers just saying how it moved them or how it um, made them reflect on their relationship with their mother or their relationship with their daughter or uh, really made them feel like they were not alone in their feelings about home and so so that's just the most gratifying were these famous people who were kind of untouchable but the truth is that when you're an author you just slave away writing your book and and if someone sends you a letter that feels like a miracle so you should do that <laughs> um what writers are among your favorites or who you feel have influenced your own work I really love Louise Erdrich, who's a, a Native American author, who's written lots of novels and an amazing collection of linked short stories called Love Medicine. I love uh, Marilyn Robinson, has a, a novel called Housekeeping, which was very influential when I was younger, and she continues to write beautiful books. Um, I don't know, maybe you can get some shots at some point of my, I just, I love books, so there are books everywhere in my house, and I feel like I could talk about every one of them <laughs> forever, but, yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you feel those writers have influenced you? Hmm. I really, um, I've always been drawn to writers who, whose work incorporates place and landscape, so, uh, I didn't mention, but Faulkner and Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor, kind of our famous Southern American writers, have been big influences on me. Um, Eudora Welty writes, has written that one, understanding one place lets us understand all places better. And I really love reading fiction that acknowledges that relationship between humans and the landscapes that they reside on and how we're shaped by our communities and our cultures and how the community and culture are shaped by landscape and weather and geography and um, it's really those like vertical ways of understanding place that are fascinating to me. So writers who explore that and history and memory and how those are embedded in place, that's all fascinating to me. Um, which might be because I live on this piece of land where my dad grew up, and where my grandmother collected all of these stories from. So it's kind of how I know the world, is through a, a piece of land where generations have lived, where my kids are now living, and how, how history and memory have these ripple effects on that place. That's fascinating to me. Um, do you consider yourself a professional writer? I do. I probably wouldn't have said that a year ago. A year ago I was trying, I was doing a lot of freelance editing of other people's books, so that means that people would bring me a book that they were working on and I would make edits and help them publish it. Um, and I have been a house cleaner and I've been a carpenter and I've worked on my mom's farm and I've been a substitute teacher and I've been a freelance teacher. So I've worked all of these jobs for the last 20 years, but this year I'm actually, yeah, making a living writing. So I'm a professional writer. Yeah. So um, about how many years did it take you for you to feel like you, you could call yourself a professional writer? Like when somebody asked you what you did, you would answer that you yeah. were a writer? So I'd say just this past year. So that's uh, 10 years after I decided that writing was really what I wanted to focus on, and 20 years after, I knew that I wanted to write, but didn't even dare admit it. So, a long time. And um, why did you make the effort to become a professional writer in the first place? Um, you know, part of it's just what we're good at. We, we have to take our personalities and do things in the world that work with our personalities and the way that we exist in the world. So for me, I, I love um, observing and thinking about what I'm observing and processing that through words. And that involves 
a lot of time spent alone and and writing. So so that that works for my it, it matches my personality. And then I also believe that stories are an amazing way for people to understand one another and to understand places better. So I have kind of a political, social mission with my stories, which is to expand people's understanding of their communities and what it's like to be another human being. And what would you say are among the more difficult parts of being a writer? One of the difficult parts is just being by yourself all day, having to work on it without much feedback. So I've been working on this novel for a year and a half, and I just sit all day whenever I, I'm not with my kids writing it, and sometimes that feels amazing, and sometimes that feels horrible. It just feels like, what is this? Why would anybody ever want to read this? It'll never be any good. So you, there's just a lot of self-doubt that comes with writing. The, the gratification comes, there are long stretches between periods of gratification and um, and it's solitary. I don't really see many people during the day when I'm working. So that is, that is one of the harder elements for me. Um, how do you decide what you want to write about? I, the story, the collection of stories, I've known that I wanted to write a collection of short stories set in Vermont and about Vermont for so long, but that never felt like a decision. It wasn't like, what should I sit down and write about today? It was all of these people who I'd observed my whole life and I wanted to tell their stories, and so those just came. Um, when I went to work on my novel, I had pieces of it that I'd been working on for a long time, so I, I knew parts of what it was about, but I really think you have to, you have to take kind of the most burning questions that you are struggling with as a person and write as a way of answering those questions or trying to answer those questions. So it's not, my stories don't come from some idea of, oh, this would be a neat character in a neat situation, but more, um, what am I trying to figure out as a person? And my, I'm going to create char characters who are trying to figure that out as well. Um, have you ever felt discouraged and considered stopping your efforts at writing? Uh, I really haven't, mostly because you don't need to be successful to write, and I just have always known that I would write no matter what. And so getting a book published kind of felt it felt amazing, but it was also a complete surprise. I never expected to get a book published. I just knew that I wanted to write as a way to keep myself happy and sane, and um, hopefully share it in some way with others. But so no, I've never considered giving up. I'll, I'll write through to the end, whether people read what I make or not. Um, would you please describe a typical day when you write? Do you have certain routines or places that help you write? I, yeah, so my kids go to school at, I believe at 8, and Owen leaves at 8.30, and then I make myself some black tea, and in the summertime I, I usually write here, this is my little office, but in the wintertime I get cold when I'm writing because you're not moving, you're just bent over a computer, so I work next to the wood stove. And I usually sit on the floor and lean over the couch, probably not the best place, and have to force, it's, I have a new dog, which is really helpful in that I get to take Oki for a walk in the middle of the day, and that gets me outside and out of my head. So I work for a couple hours, drink a little too much tea, go for a walk, and feel better. <laughs> Um, being a published author involves more than writing. Would you describe how you first found a publisher for your work? So, the um, the typical process is that you finish your book, get it as good as you can possibly get it, and then um, you send it to an agent, a literary agent, whose job is to find books that they think are good, and then send those books out to publishers. 
So I found an agent who is a friend of a friend, and then it was her job to send my book out to different publishers. And then my publisher wanted it. Um, when, you set a, when you send a manuscript to your publisher, do you always work with the same editor, or are there several involved? Um, I have one editor, and she's wonderful, so I hope that she stays for the long haul. I know some writers who they start working at, at a publisher, and then their editor leaves, and so they work with another editor. But it's really it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with one editor. Okay, yeah. Um, would you describe the editing process, first your own process, then what happens when you work with a professional editor? So, I think it's really good to have, with these stories, I had teachers who were reading them and giving me feedback, and I also had friends, so I just think it's really important to have friends who you trust who you can show your work to before you show it to an editor or an agent or anybody else, really get um, that in-depth feedback because it's so hard to get any kind of perspective and distance on our own work. So I sent my work out to my friends, my closest friends who I really trust, and sometimes their feedback is kind of global, like, I think that you need to still figure out what the heart of this story is and what this story is about, and sometimes it's, this is great, but I wonder if this character could be more defined, you know, smaller stuff. So uh, I'm still trying to figure that out with my novel, which is such a a much bigger project, so more it's harder to figure out the arc of the story and the big picture. And I'm at the point now where my editor has seen it once. Really, working with the editor is a lot like working with a good teacher. You know, she, she it's her job to make this book the best that it can be and help me believe in myself. And so, working with the right editor is fabulous. <laughs> Um, how much of your time is given to the promotion of your books, such as public readings and radio or television appearances? So, uh, my book came out in August, and I spent a good two months doing some written interviews for magazines, and then some radio interviews, and then I traveled. I didn't do an extensive national book tour, but I traveled a lot throughout New England and um, doing readings. So it was a couple months of that, and a little bit of travel. I got to fly to Texas two weeks ago to go to a literary festival, which was fun. Yeah. Is there any experience while on your book tour that comes to mind as being especially touching or funny or unfortunate? <laughs> um, my favorite part without doubt is just read, getting to read with other authors. So um, the readings that I did where I get to go out for dinner beforehand with writers or hang out with them afterwards, that's just, that's the, that's the golden gem of the whole career as far as I'm concerned. Um, where are some of the places you've read that you felt were important for you? I read, um, hmm. my favorite reading was here in Brattleboro just because it was my hometown and my whole family was there. I was all weepy just because it was such an emotional thing. These stories are about Vermont and a lot of my friends and family members are wound into the collection in various ways. And so reading in front of all those people was just very powerful and potent and yeah, emotional. Um, who are some of your personal favorite authors? I mentioned some of them before. I love Marilyn Robinson. I love Louise Erdrich. I love the poet C.D. Wright. I love Willa Cather. I'm looking at my bookshelf. I love Wallace Stegner. Um, so many. Yeah. Um, is there any specific genre of literature that you like to read for a pleasure? I love, I mean, I'm a fiction writer, so I love reading fiction, but I also really love poetry, and poetry feeds my work. I kind of go to it as a touchstone when I'm feeling, sometimes I feel like fiction is, uh, 
it's hard to get lost in other people's grand stories all the time, but poetry is this potent little uh, magical sauce that I can read and then get re-enthused to work on my own fiction. So I read a lot of poetry and non-fiction. Um, many of my questions about your life as an author are similar to those about your work as a musician. Um, would you speak generally about your musical background, your musical heritage, and your musical genetic code? <laughs> so, I mentioned earlier that my grandmother, who moved to MacArthur Road in the 1940s, went around collecting folk songs. and. She then, when I was growing up and when I was a baby, she had a really good career traveling around in her van and playing concerts and playing at folk festivals. And my dad and my uncle and my aunt would play with her. So I spent a lot of time in the van with them and listening to shit, listening to them play, sometimes being on stage with them. I would sometimes, my brother and I would fall asleep in my aunt's ba upright bass case during concerts. And uh, there were also at my grandparents' house up the road, my grandmother just always had musician friends who were traveling through who would stay there. And so there were often concerts happening. And so I grew up with just lots of music being performed around me, and um, I always thought that I loved it, and that no way did I want to be a musician, because I had no interest in getting up on stage and performing in front of people. Um, and then...